work really hard to get a very clear understanding of what the other person means by the terms that they use. Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. We've got part two of our discussion with Greg Kokel about how to navigate difficult conversations, particularly surrounding the issue of progressive Christianity. So before we get into that, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, which is the Impact 360 Gen Z Lab. So if you have a heart for young people about 20 years old and younger, if you want to know how to help lead them through the toughest questions they're encountering every day, then you're going to want to go and check out Gen Z Lab, where Impact 360 has gathered thought leaders like uh, Sean McDowell, Jonathan Morrow, Christopher Yuan to help you understand the unique challenges that Gen Z is facing. It's going to equip you to lead them through this post-Christian culture. So you can go to impact360.org for more information. There's a lot of cool stuff. It's exclusive content. You'll have access to a Facebook group where you can encourage and be encouraged by like-minded people. Again, that's impact360.org. This week, we're continuing our conversation with the president and founder of Stand to Reason Ministries, Greg Kokel. You can go to str.org to find all kinds of great apologetics resources like blog posts and podcasts and videos, just a wonderful resource. But Greg, last week, we we had so much fun, we decided, you know, we need That's to, right. we need to keep, keep going. There's just a lot more to talk about, isn't there? Yeah, my goodness, that time went so fast, and I was having such a good time with you, and I hope the audience was as well, so I'm glad to be back on board. Well, I have to tell you that this is a really important topic because part of what I do in my work is I'm writing a lot about the what of progressive Christianity. So I'm talking about how to spot the ideas, what do progressive Christians believe, what unifies them ideologically. But the one thing I just don't have a lot of time to talk about, or I haven't as of yet, is how to actually interact with people in your right. life that are being swept up by these ideas. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times there's philosophical assumptions that are undergirding their views. There are things they don't even realize that they've caught from culture that are informing the way they believe about certain things. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think this is such an important podcast series. And I know that that my my listeners and my new, now my video watchers are really excited to, to learn a little more. And uh -huh. so we're going to dive in by sort of picking up where we left off last week. And so for All anyone right. who's new this, this week, we talked about certain tactics, questions to ask, Ask when you're interacting with people you disagree with, and, and more in a more focused way, we're talking about how to use those tactics with uh, progressive Christians. And so we talked about the Columbo tactic, certain questions we can ask, <laughs> like, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? And, and maybe even taking it a bit further with, have you considered and, and offering an alternate view? But right. Greg, in your chapter six of tactics, you talk about specifically how to perfect that Columbo tactic. So so let's pick it up there. How can we perfect our Colombo tactic? Well, it, in one sense, it's not difficult. Uh, it, it's uh, just doing it. I have a saying I use now when I when I give talks to audiences, and I say, by, I tell them how good this is and how the feedback I've got from so many on it, and then I tell them, oh, by the way, if you don't do it, it don't work. Mm. Right. <laughs> it's just like it's just like a lot of other things that that we are, we are confronted with. OK. And that is if if we if we aren't willing to step out, if we aren't willing to start using the kind of questions we talked about last time. And in fact, when you um, discussed um, we talked about the basics of the the game plan, which I call the Colombo tactic after the the infamous uh, Lieutenant Colombo of TV fame many years ago, uh, who used to ask questions to kind of get to the uh, to, to the root of the matter, solve his crimes, but also to gather information. Um, one of those questions, and you went over them very quickly right there, is what do you mean by that? And I think sometimes people move past that too quickly. Um, and what they, they they don't realize the power of that question. Now, you're dealing with a lot of people who are involved with progressive Christianity. And progressive Christianity has um, a unique kind of challenge, and that is it, it, it stands in 
after a fashion for Christianity, much like something like uh, Mormonism does, and uses a lot of the same language that Christians use, but it has very, very different definitions yes. for those words. And this is something you emphasized last time around, and I wanted to emphasize, uh, re-emphasize, so people don't miss this, that one of the most important things that they can, that, that, that your people can do is work really hard to get a very clear understanding of what the other person means by the terms that they used. And in your book, which I've read already, it'll be out in the fall sometime, I think, um, Another Gospel, uh, you talk about first-person accounts with a pastor who was a progressive Christian pastor, and you asked some very pointed questions about definitions. And even in doing that, you were still, um, I want to be careful how I say this, misled, and maybe yeah. not purposefully, it's hard to tell, you were there, I wasn't, but the idea was the answers that were given were in themselves um, still vague enough to pass as Christian answers right. when you learned later that they were not. Exactly. And so one of the things that I want to emphasize here on improving your Colombo tactic is to is to really get clear on what the other person's view is. Do not rush past this circumstance, okay? Do not rush, I'm sorry, don't rush past this question. Uh, be sure that you get a very, very clear understanding and, and pay attention to the other person when they're talking because, gee, I wanna have the most charitable perspective here regarding people we're talking with, but sometimes people just are not upfront. They are not honest about uh, their views. This is true, not just with maybe some progressive Christians, but with atheists as well. And uh, in other kinds of skeptics, they kind of dance around issues because they don't want to get pinned down. But this is where you need to pin them down in a good way to get really, really good clarification on these particular issues. So that's just, well, one way you can Im improve uh, your Colombo tech. I wish I had my, I gotta get my book out here so I could think of everything that was in that chapter. <clears throat> that I said, practice, of course, is really yeah. important. <clears throat> and sometimes um, the difficult times um, to deal with an issue are when someone who is contrary to your view is standing in front of you and you're thinking, I don't know what to say. Right. And so we're not really that quick on our feet. Now, I think people have said to me at different times, how could you come up with these answers? How could you come up with these questions? How could you come up with these statements, these dialogues? And uh, you're so quick on your feet. Well, I actually don't consider myself quick on my feet. Um, mm -hmm. What has happened is I have prepared for circumstances I suspect will come up and figured out my my approach beforehand, and I practiced it, okay? So the, think of it this way. The, the best time to come up with great questions or uh, comments or whatever with a person who's challenging you is when the pressure's off, not when the pressure's on. Yeah. And when is the pressure off? Well, either before the event or after the event, okay? So, um, so this is what I, I try to anticipate. I, I think about something that's come up in conversation, uh, in the cultural dialogue, that is the kind of thing that if somebody said it to me would stop me in my tracks and I'd have to think about how to deal with that. Now, you don't want to get caught like that very often because the timing there sometimes is critical. You only have a few seconds, 10 seconds, I call it the 10 second window in order to say something that's meaningful to get in the driver's seat and begin to move this conversation in a direction that you want it to go. And, uh, but if you're just thinking about it in the heat of the moment, you may lose that window of opportunity. And look, you don't have to be a perfectionist on this. I don't have all the answers, but the more we can smoothly move into the next step of the conversation, the better, or else the other person feels justified in the kind of challenge they've offered. So uh, a couple of years back when we were having more of a public conversation about same-sex marriage, the other side kept using this term called marriage equality. Mm. Marriage equality. Yeah. Well, this, that sounds great, marriage equality, until you realize the kind of what the word was being pressed into service to do, same-sex marriage, which in my view is not really a marriage because marriage is by definition 
by its very nature between couples that can reproduce, to put it simply. I don't want to get into that discussion, but I thought if somebody asked me, well, so you don't believe or made the charge, you don't believe in um, marriage equality, what would I say? And I started thinking about it. And then I thought, here's a question I could ask. Do you believe children should be married? No, of course not. Well, then you don't believe in marriage equality either. Yeah. You yeah. believe in restrictions on marriage, and so do I. We just have a different place to draw the line. Neither of us believes in marriage equality. So now I got that. Mm. I've got it in my hip pocket, so to speak. If somebody busts me with the marriage equality charge or the challenge, I can ask them a question. Yeah. Do you think children, et cetera? And so what I'm doing is defusing that rhetorical moment for them. How do I do that? Because I thought of it in advance. And I think your listeners can think of all kinds of places maybe where they've gotten stonewalled in the past and think about what question can I ask that would be in a meaningful way um, defuse that particular comment. Now, that requires a little knowledge. So you might have to do a little research and thinking on it. But then once you plan that, you kind of put it in your mind, you role play it a little bit on your own or with another person, it becomes more a part of you. Yeah. And you're ready next time around. The other time when the pressure is off is when <laughs> after the conversation and you look back on it, and you say, oh, man, that didn't go too well. <laughs> How could I have improved that? And uh, that happens to me with plenty of frequency. And uh, I even talk in the book about uh, an encounter I had with a young lady after a, a service where I had just been teaching on the Colombo tactic. She confronts me in the, uh, in the entry area where I'm shaking hands as people are going out, and I totally blundered. I don't want to go into the details now, but just take my word for it. I really, really um, tripped up. And then I began to think afterwards, gosh, how could I have improved that? And now I've thought of a way that I could do it. Next time I'm in that situation, I have some questions in place already. That will help me through it. So plan ahead, either because you see the problem coming up in the future or because you messed up on it in the past. And when you think through it and then role play it a little bit, it makes a world of difference. I often will ask an audience, how many people like tests? Almost nobody raises their hand. How many people are happy with tests if you know all the answers? Everybody raises their hand. Right. The pressure is on us when we don't know how to respond. Well, I don't know if you've heard the same thing I've heard about how William Lane Craig does his debates, but you know he's world yeah. renowned as being one of the greatest debaters ever. And I've heard this, That's that right. he has every possible objection that will come against what he might say. And then he's got responses on his, in papers in, in his folder. And he just pulls out as the person starts yeah. to make the objection, he pulls it out. So, I mean, it's, you know, even the best of us uh, try to think ahead and try to be prepared with, with these questions. But I, I find that the Colombo tactic and perfecting that is really such an important part because it's one thing to learn how to do it. It's one thing to learn what the questions are, but you you do have to do it over and over and over again for that to just become ingrained. You know, I think it's like that with all apologetics. I remember when I sure. first started studying the cosmological argument, it was like, I understand it. And then someone tried to get me to explain it to them. And it, I mean, I, I sounded like a crazy person from the movie A Beautiful Mind or something. It just sounded oh. insane because I, I obviously didn't have enough practice at explaining it. Whereas yeah. years later, it became a lot easier not just to explain it, but even to learn to ask questions, to get someone else to kind of come to the conclusions you're wanting them to come sure. to. So it takes a lot of practice. And I'm yeah. really glad that you brought up that story from my book. And I'll just tell it really quickly for some of the uh, the listeners that may not be familiar. I think most of my listeners right now are familiar with the fact that I went through a really dark time of doubt that was sort of initiated by this study group that I was in, in a church that went on to become a progressive Christian church. And so in the early stages, of being in that class, I was really uncomfortable with a lot of the 
the stuff we were learning, the discussions we were having, the book that that he was having us read. And in fact, I was so naive. I, I remember reading this one book thinking, is he having us read this to see if we can spot deception? <laughs> like, I mean, I was that naive. <laughs> and so I, I remember just being really at odds with a lot of what was going on. And so the pastor asked me, he said, you know, you can ask me any question you want to, and I'll answer honestly. Like, whatever you want to ask me, I'll give you a straight answer. And so the two questions that just popped into my mind for some reason was, number one, do you believe the Bible is divinely inspired? And I asked him that outright. And the second question I asked him was, do you believe in hell? Do you believe that's an actual place? And to both questions, he answered an unequivocal yes. In fact, I remember him even using the example of Hitler. He says, do I believe Hitler just woke up in heaven after he died? No, I, I definitely believe in that. And I believe the Bible's divinely inspired. And so that gave me enough to say, okay, well, we're on the same page enough with that stuff that I can continue in this class. Uh, well, I came to find out weeks later, maybe even a couple months later, that what he meant by hell was not the historic understanding of hell, but that maybe it's some sort of a, a temporary you know, rehabilitation program, or it's the negative choices that we make on earth and the consequences we bear because of those choices. And then I also learned that what he meant by divinely inspired was that the Bible was inspired, but maybe on the same level as C.S. Lewis. Or when you listen yeah. to a really good sermon, obviously God inspired that, he, would, he, he said. And so he was actually lowering the view of biblical inspiration by still using the phrase, which is why I think it's so important when we talk with progressive Christians that we really do define our terms because they use a lot of historic terms like God's word. They'll call the Bible God's word, they'll say, I have a very high view of scripture. But this mm. is where the questions are so important because then we can ask, well, what do you mean by God's word? What mm -hmm. do you mean by high view of scripture? And what you may discover is that when they say high view of scripture, what they're really saying is, well, I, I have such a high view of it that I'm not going to overinflate what I think it is. I'm going to take it mm. at face value and, and realize that maybe these people were just giving their best opinions about who God was in the time and and the places that they lived in. And so what they're considering to be a high view, we would actually consider to be quite a low view. So these are these right. are really important questions to practice right. and just kind of get into your vocabulary and get under your skin. Right. So let the, me let me go back yeah. just for a moment briefly, uh, just to reemphasize something we talked about about doing it and practicing and it takes practice. <clears throat> it does take practice, but it's not hard to practice in this right. case. The liability for some people who are really timid is that they think, wow, I'm jumping into the deep end of the pool. This is not the deep end of the pool. To ask somebody what you mean by that or ask them how what are the reasons for their view, that is the shallow end of the pool because it's very easy to do and there's no risk for the Christian. The Christian does not have to go any further. You don't have to commit yourself to getting into conflict in the Bible and all these other things. I encourage more timid Christians just simply to commit themselves to be students for a couple of months of other people's ideas without preaching at them, just learning. And then you'll see how easy it is um, to move forward. And then it will become second nature. The other side of the spectrum is people who are so aggressive, they don't want to ask questions. They just want to preach like crazy. And this is where they're going to have to, you know, rein themselves in and be students, which is harder for them for a different reason, because they're too aggressive, not because they're too timid. Yeah. But I want to emphasize how easy it is to begin to employ the Colombo tactic, especially the first two questions, which are just types of information gathering in which the other person is doing most of the work, the talking, and you are doing the learning. You're not defending any points, so there's no pressure on you as a Christian. Yeah, that's great. And and one of the, as we sort of steer this conversation to speak directly to the issue of progressive Christianity, one of the obstacles that I come across the most often is 
talking with someone who affirms some sense of relativism. And right. so this is very popular in the progressive Christian church. In fact, I reviewed a, a book by Lisa Gunger in which she argues for this view, this, this, re, this view of the nature of truth that is relativism. Many uh, progressive Christian leaders will, will actually admit outright, look, we are postmodern. We are trying to make a postmodern correction to the modernist view of, of spirituality and rationality. And so let's, let's address that a bit because I think for Christians who are talking to their progressive Christian friends, they may not realize that this issue is undergirding a lot of the viewpoint that, that is being spouted back at them, but they sure. may not be that great at identifying it. So first tell us what is relativism well, and, and yeah, how pervasive do you think that is in our culture? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to put it. I know the easiest way to put it, but it might <laughs> it might not make sense to a lot of folk. Relativism is when truth claims are mind dependent. <laughs> That's the simplest way to put it. Yeah. What I mean by that is a thing is true if a person believes it to be so. Right. Now, um, that is a radical departure from the way we normally understand the word and frankly, the way not only the massive portion of our culture use the word, but all postmoderns use the word when their guard is down. Yeah. If 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 the postmodern goes to his boss and the boss and he's spouting postmodernism, blah, 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 blah. And then he opens up his payroll check and said, wait, I got shorted. And he said, No, I paid you what you you have come. And no, you didn't. Yes, I did. It's only five hundred dollars. You owe me six hundred dollars. What is that a discussion about? That's a discussion about the way the world is, not the way people think. Right. Is it true that he got paid in a, a hit the true the proper amount? Well, it depends on whether he got the money that was promised to him yeah. and that he earned. It isn't dependent on what the employer believes about it. Well, I believe that's what you deserve, so that's all or I believe that's what we agree, whatever. And of course, this has come out, this concept has come out in spades when we talk about things like gender. Mm -hmm. And maybe many of uh, your listeners have seen that videotape where somebody goes on campus and he's asking people about gender issues and then he goes into other issues. Well, if I said this is obviously a, a, like a 25 year old male doing the interviewing, if I said that I was a 40 year old Asian woman that was six foot five and I believed I was, would that be true? Right. Now, on relativism, it would be true. Because the person truth is depends on what a person believes, not on anything in the objective world. Right. OK, so I, I think people get a sense of that. This is applied in a lot of areas. Moral relativism is not the idea that some things are actually right and wrong out there in the world, but they are right for me, but they may not be right for you or wrong for me. But not notice how morality is relativized to the individual who believes these things and therefore no one's beliefs could ever be false. Right. Because the definition of truth is grounded in the belief. Yeah. Okay. Which that sounds counterintuitive that no one yeah. could ever be wrong in their view. What's interesting though, is progressives and postmoderns of all sorts are trying to educate people exactly. on the right way to view things yeah. which is their way. So let me give you an illustration. And and this, by the way, is an example of what I call in the book, the suicide tactic. And maybe I'll give you a, a role play in just a moment of how this works. The suicide tactic is when somebody's point of view is self refuting. Okay. When, uh, when, 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 if I say to you, Alisa, I cannot sit, speak a single word of English of course, my statement is false just in the speaking of it. Right. Because it's all in English. Or there are no sentences that are more than three words in length. What about that sentence kind of thing? Yes, so yeah. now those are very obvious examples. Here's another one that's obvious that people miss a lot. Um, there is no truth. Right. No truth in the objective sense. Okay. Okay. How am I supposed to take that? Now, I want to agree with that person. I mean, I think the person wants to, me to agree with them. Let me put it that way. And, and they want me to think that their statement is correct. 
But the minute that I am tempted to say their statement is correct, I realize I can't say that because the minute I say that it's correct, I am also at the same moment saying it's false. Right. Because the statement is true that there is no truth. Wait a minute. That's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. And that's why the question that's appropriate to ask when somebody says that there is no truth is, is, is that statement that you just made, is that true? Right. <laughs> is it true? Because if it's false, it's false. And if it's true, it's false too. Yeah. It is necessarily false. It is self-refuting. Okay. See, this is the problem with relativism when applied broadly to the issue of truth. When it comes to desserts, yeah, what's true for me may not be the true for you. You know, I'm not a real sweets person. I'm more on the salty side of things, but I do like certain kinds of ice cream. I go nutty for it. And speaking of nuts, I want my brownies with walnuts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's really important. And my chocolate chips with lots of walnuts and lots of chocolate chips, but that's about it for me. Those are good to me, Yeah. but they may not be good to other people. So some things, personal preference things are relative to the individual. I don't dispute that who would, mm -hmm. but everything no, everything's not relative. And the reason we know everything's not relative is because there is a world out there, states of affairs, if you will, that we have to know some accurate things about. And if we didn't, we would be dead in a day. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I take meds every morning. I'm an old guy, right? So, uh, you know, people go get in their car. Can you, you ever think about how easy it is to die in an accident? Cars are going by each other at 50 miles an hour yeah. and only a foot distance between them. That's a hundred miles an hour dead impact force, right? That's dangerous. But we navigate this all the time. We don't even think about it because we have the ability to determine by and large in many, many important things what the truth of the matter actually is. So it is not the case that everything is a matter of personal opinion, and there is no truth in the way that postmoderns want to characterize it. And by the way, I'll just show you, let me give you one other illustration, why that whole project is so obviously self-refuting. I had a student tell me about a class they had, and this actually was in a Christian university, okay, which I will not mention the name, but it was a Christian school. And the teacher said, are you God? To the students, are you God? No takers. Okay, good. Yes. You see, God knows truth, she said, and she turned and wrote on the board the word truth with a capital T. We are not God, and so we don't know truth with a capital T, oh. presumably objective truth, the way the world actually is. All we know is this truth, T-R-U-T-H, all small letters, lowercase. So, uh, I assume she so, I assume she believed that her statements were objectively true, right? Of course, yes. And the kids are taking notes. Is this going to yeah, be on yeah. the test? You know, and nobody <laughs> realized that she just destroyed Christianity. Right. And the question that should have been asked is something like this. Um, Professor, I'm a little confused about what you've just told us. Um, that description that you just gave, is that an accurate description of things? Well, of course it is. I wouldn't be teaching. Okay, but when I say accurate, I'm asking if it's actually true. Well, yeah, it's true. Okay, now I need to know, is it a capital T truth or is it a small t truth? Because if it's a, you can see where I'm going yeah, with this. Yeah. If it's a capital T truth, she already said, we can't know that unless we're God. But if it's a small t truth, that means it's just our personal opinion. It's our truth. And who cares? You have right. your small t, I have my small t. Let's, you know... Who cares? So that's an example of, uh, I think people can see how that notion is self-refuting, but it is debilitating to a lot of people when they confront it if they don't know how to maneuver with it. And I do talk about that, a number of examples of that in the book. And uh, it's, it's debilitating to Christianity and it's debilitating to human knowledge. Here's a key though, and I talk about this a little bit in the inside out tactic of the book. The fact is nobody really believes this nonsense. They don't right. really believe it. And you know they don't really believe it because it's obviously false. And you just listen to them for a while. And the words that come out of their mouth contradict that. Yeah. Just like that teacher said. Yeah.
Well, just like in, people saying there is no truth. Yeah, and in my interactions with progressive Christians, particularly online, it almost always goes to relativism, almost always. And what's so just fascinating each time is that as the claim comes out, however they want to word it, what's true for you is true for you, or if they'll uh, maybe add a little nuance by saying, you know, I don't, I, I think truth is determined by our feelings, or they might say, uh, you can't know truth. There, there is objective truth somewhere, but nobody can claim to, yeah. to know it, you know, however it comes out. What's so interesting uh, just about every time though is the reason they've come on my post or, you know, a, a, an article that I've written or something along the lines is to tell me I'm wrong about yes, the way reality is, about the way yeah. Jesus is, about the way Christianity is. I'm dead wrong about that. Yeah. But yet at the same time, coexisting with that is this claim that you can't know truth or that truth doesn't exist. Yes, and right. so it's, like you said, it's a, it's a, it commits suicide on itself. The thought does. Right. It's, it refutes That's right. itself. It's, it's a, the, the suicidal element is implicit in almost every single thing that they say. And uh, and they do not see it, and most Christians do not see it. But I'll tell you something. Once you see it, it stands out like a neon sign every time it lights up. And this is where you must use a question to demonstrate the problem. You can't just point the finger because that's accusatory. Be like Lieutenant Colombo, you know, it's just something about this thing bothers me. So there was a young man who's, I'm talking to him about some moral issue, asked me questions about it, we're having a pleasant conversation. And then uh, then when my point of view came up, he said, you know what, you Christians are nice people, but pretty soon you start getting judgmental. Mm. What he said, okay. So I asked him, and now this is Colombo, clarif clarification, right? I said, what's wrong with that? And then he said, well, it's wrong to judge. Now, I, I said, ask the question to get him to make the statement right. baldly, not implicitly, but explicitly. But now what has he just done? By saying it's wrong to judge and including me in this conversation regarding that, he is judging me. Yeah. Now, I could have said, well, you're judging me, so you know better. Well, I guess that would be true, but it would be uh, it wouldn't be very clever, right? It, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be very shrewd. Instead, what I said, his name was Gil Gilbert. You know, I said, Gil, if it if it's wrong to judge, then why are you judging me right now? Right. That's all I said. Did he have an answer? And man, it was like I hit him with a two by four. Yeah. You know, he was speechless. He didn't know what to say. And then he said, Well, okay, I. I I guess it's okay to judge. That's what he said. But oh. he said, you can't push your morality on somebody else. And he thought he'd improved his situation. <laughs> I said, Gil, is that your morality? What you just told me? So there's a clarification question, Columbo mm -hmm. number one. And he said, yeah, that's my morality. I said, okay, then now I'm confused. Why are you pushing it on me right now? Right. Huh? You know, he's back to the same place. Yeah. He thought it was a word trick, but it wasn't a word trick. If you listen carefully, you'll hear these things all over, but use a question to expose the problem. And don't get mad. Don't get nasty. Get a little curious. Like, now I'm confused. Yeah. yeah. You told me there's no truth, but then you're telling me that I'm wrong in this. Are you telling me I'm wrong? No, I'm not telling you wrong. Well, well then what are you telling me? You're correcting me, right? Right. Well, kind of. Well, if you're correcting me, then that means you think you're right and I'm wrong. Is that right? Am I, what, are, what am I missing here? Right, See, right. that's the nature of the back and forth conversation to expose the self-refuting nature of what they're saying. And I think that the questions are also that there's an added element of importance when talking with progressive Christians by with using questions because because of that sort of assumption of relativism, even though they may not realize it, some do, some don't. When we start to just make a bunch of truth claims or dogmatic statements, because they are already conditioned to think that that's judgmental or uh, confrontive or you know even harmful in some way, they're, that's li li likely to stop the conversation. But when you yeah. ask questions like you're talking about, it's a very clever way to invite more conversation, uh, mm -hmm. and especially with somebody that's sort of uh, just adopting the assumption of relativism. But I want to circle back around to something we started talking about earlier, and that's this redefinition of words that we can get to by asking questions. Sure. And uh, so so in this first part, let's talk about a couple of words that I've, I've actually heard you give a whole lecture 
lecture on this first word that was so brilliant years ago. I, I like saved it on my computer. I watched it at least a couple of times. And, and that's the word tolerance. And mm -hmm. I think that this is one of those words that we can really start talking past each other if we don't define it. Because classically, right. it, has a, it has a definition, but that has changed in our culture. So talk to us for a that's moment right. about the word tolerance. Well, yeah, this this is a um, I, the talk is called the intolerance of tolerance, mm -hmm. and uh, you can get versions of it on YouTube if you want to see the whole thing. But the 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 point that I make there is that the notion of tolerance, which is a a, a virtue, tolerance is a virtue, and there's a reason it's a virtue. But what has happened is it's gone on its head, so that now what is called tolerance is really intolerance and what is intolerance is called tolerance and and but the people don't realize it because the word is still there and it sounds good whatever and so so let me just make this observation first to kind of lay the foundation and i'll give you an illustration of how this plays out um the word the word tolerance refers to a virtuous uh, a virtuous, a virtuous <laughs> it's not easy to say. attitude towards someone with whom you disagree. Right. Okay. Let me say it again. With whom you disagree. Okay. So I might say, do you tolerate homosexuality? Of course I do. Oh, so you think it's wrong? No, I don't. I think it's fine. Well, then you don't tolerate it. You agree with it. Right. All right. Tolerance is reserved for things that you disagree with. But in spite of the disagreement, you are willing to treat the individual who holds the view with respect regardless. OK, so tolerance pertains to a way we treat people, not the way we treat ideas. OK, and um, and this is what's gone topsy turvy, because nowadays the idea is if if you have an idea that um, if someone has an idea that you disagree with and you take exception with the idea, uh, then you are considered intolerant for not being accepting of the idea. And notice, by the way, if you are not accepting of the idea, this often makes it open season on you as an individual. Yeah. So people can be very unvirtuous towards you in the names they call you and the way they treat you if you're not walking in lockstep with their ideas. And this is this is how it's gone topsy turvy. Yeah. OK, so here's a great example of how this has turned around. And I think it's a way that you can um, in conversation help people to see this. Um if somebody calls you a name, just generally speaking, I call this the sticks and stones tactic. You know, sticks and stones can break your home bones, but names will never hurt you. If somebody calls you a name, in, just as a general principle, always ask for a definition. Force that person to define the word they're using to demonstrate why you qualify for that name. You're talking about something like somebody says, your opinion makes you a bigot or... Something along those lines. Yeah, sure. Or intolerant. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, oh, so somebody says to me, I'll, I'll role play it. They say, well, you're intolerant. Yeah. So I, I would say, wait a minute. I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Why would you call, what am I doing now that makes you think that I'm intolerant? He said, well, you think you're right and other people are wrong. Hmm. Well, I do think that I'm right and other people are wrong, but I'm not the only one in this discussion who thinks he's right. And that's the key to know. Yeah. Uh, listen, if I didn't believe that my beliefs were true, I wouldn't believe what I believe. I would believe something else. I believe that were true instead. OK, so what I want to do now is 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 use my questions to help that person see that. So he says, you're intolerant. I said, what does that mean? That means you think you're right. Well, I do. I could be mistaken. I'm willing to talk about it. But let me ask you a question. Do you think that you're right? Now, what's he going to say? He can't say, no, I think I'm wrong. Right. Now, what he might do if he tries to be consistent with his postmodernism, he might, he might think, well, I think I'm right for me. I said, OK, well, then why are you talking to me right now? Right. <laughs> you know, it sounds like you're correcting me. You want me to be like you, the tolerant person. No, the fact is, of course, he thinks he's right. And so now here's the final question. Why is it when I think I'm right, I'm intolerant. But when you think you're right, you're just right. 
what am I missing That's a here? Good question. Okay. Yeah. The ball goes back into their court. Now, what we're trying to show here is that they're just playing a game, a name calling game. That's all they're doing. Okay. They have switched the subject. Maybe we're talking about same sex marriage. And I get my point of view and they say, well, that's not, you're intolerant. Okay. Well, notice how we were talking about a topic and now we're talking about my personality. Mm. So what I might've asked is why did you change the subject just now? What do you mean? Well, now we're talking about my personality. I actually, this happened to me on a TV discussion once in a Canadian TV show. And I pointed it out, you know, how we've shifted to a conversation about my, my character. And if I, in that same conversation, if he called me intolerant, what if I said, okay, and you're ugly. <laughs> now I wouldn't say that even if right. it were true, I wouldn't say that because first of all, it would be bad manners, but secondly, it would be irrelevant because even ugly people can have accurate ideas about things. And so can intolerant people have accurate ideas. Calling a person name doesn't disqualify their ideas. What they've done is gotten in a habit of dissing the person for not being politically correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they call that what I'm doing in tolerance and their actions as tolerance. Yeah. They're the tolerant folk that are calling me all kinds of names. What kind of tolerance is that? Right. So that's a, a little bit of an insight there. We could talk about it for a long time. Obviously, I talk 45 minutes in the talk about it. But um, it, we have a, a section in the book uh, where I deal with those particular issues. And I actually just did a recent video, a five minute video for Dennis Prager on the very issue. If somebody wants to go to Prager U and uh, check that out as well, because I go into some detail there. We'll link that in the podcast notes, and we'll also link your lecture in the podcast notes, along with your book and all the other stuff that we're talking about <laughs> today. Uh, but along with the word tolerance, I think another word that's gotten a major makeover is the word love. So yes. let's talk about when, when we're talking with, you know, specifically a progressive Christian, and they're going to say, well, the most loving thing to do is X, Y, Z. This is where we need to ask that question, what do you mean by love? Because that, sure. that's gotten a major redefine as well. So let's talk sure. about love. And, and maybe to augment that question, you could ask, um, why do you think that what they just, just described is the most loving thing? Let's just take... For example, um, certain sexual behaviors. Um, if God tells us no about something, there's generally a good reason for it, okay? And if we violate his command, sooner or later, it's going to come back and, and haunt us, likely. And that's part of the issue. I mean, that we're looking at, at, at patterns here, okay? So when you have people who have, oh, we're just loving each other, we're having sex outside of marriage. We're just loving. Hey, what's wrong with this? We're just being sweet and loving and it's pleasurable and everything. Yeah, but these things cause pregnancies and vener ven venereal disease or sexually transmitted disease, I guess is the new term, STDs. All right. And uh, gosh, you know, that's not pretty. And if you get pregnant out of wedlock or you're single, now you've got a problem uh, that you have to solve. This baby's not going away unless you take the baby's life. And so you can see this chain of events that follow from people just doing the loving thing. The point I'm making is the attitude people have now about what the loving thing is, is very short-sighted, myopic. That's very, they, they're not looking down the line. And apart from our particular religious concerns, there's a reason why cultures have had these mores and folkways and morality. It's because they've looked down the line, they've followed, they figured it out after millennium of doing stupid stuff, what ends up happening. And this is why wise people constrain themselves. Here's another thought though. So that's why the question, why would you think this is loving? If, if certain sexual behaviors have built into them huge liabilities, okay? And uh, the same thing is true about homosexuality. That is a very unhealthy lifestyle. Um, and of course, I mean, the, the, the problems physically, forget about the moral considerations of the Bible, just the physical challenge there are legion. So why should we encourage that? Why is it loving, for example, to take somebody with gender dysphoria, which has, has, has something like 20 times increase in attempted suicide rate than the standard, okay? These, these folks are really badly troubled. 
Why are we encouraging people in that direction when it is so dangerous for them to go in that direction? How is that loving? Okay, so that's the aspect of of one part of the question. Another part, though, is really important when you're talking with Christians or those who presume to be Christians is that that the Bible defines love in 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 one place explicitly, but we see this throughout. It is clear that God's love for human beings and Jesus' love for us doesn't mean anything goes with a smile and a pat on the head. There are all kinds of restraints and restrictions that Jesus himself um, has has voiced, okay, that that kind of cramp our style and may feel unloving to some people. And in fact, I think a standard thing now, an objection against God, is if God does exist and he doesn't okay all of my sexual desires, then that God is not good by definition. Yeah. So it's a new wrinkle on this question. Yeah. If you're a Christian, look at what Jesus said and look at what God did, we see that, you know, it isn't anything goes. But if you want an explicit definition, go to 1 Corinthians 13. And this is a passage that is one of the most elegant characterizations of love. And in that is a lot of self-sacrifice expressed. But there's one statement that a lot of people miss. It says, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. If you are rejoicing in somebody's behavior that God says is wrong, you are not loving them. That kind of love is a lie. Yeah. And and I think in our culture, too, it's like what the classic definition of love, the biblical definition being, like you mentioned, self-sacrificial, rejoicing in truth, rejoicing in righteousness— it's, it's just kind of come to mean this catch-all term for affirming everything that somebody wants to do. Like that's what love has become in our culture. And so we need to be aware of that when we're talking with progressive Christians because sure. a lot of times they've just adopted that really secular definition of love. Oh. And so... Uh, by great, the way, let me jump in with something yeah. else so I don't, before I forget it. Uh, that whole attempt of progressive Christians is also suicidal. Mm. Think about this. If they're say, I mean, suicidal in the tactical sense, yes. it's self-refuting. If they're if they're taking exception with you, and it, it the, then and and what they are saying is, you're judging other people, and you shouldn't be. You should be accepting of them. That's loving. And so I might ask, would you consider yourself a loving person? Mm-hmm. Yes, I try to be as loving as I can. Then why aren't you accepting of me right now in my views? That's great. Yeah. Boom, boom. Just like that. Yeah, very good. Well, Greg, I think we've all found ourselves in a position, uh, I know I have from time to time, where we'll be having a discussion with somebody, they'll ask a question that might have an apologetic answer, uh, or, you know, you're you're able to provide the reason necessary to, to demonstrate that what they're asking can be answered. Mm -hmm. And then we come to this roadblock where they just don't seem to want to accept the truth. Right. So the, there seems to be this resistance to truth. And we have a few minutes left, and I and I wanted to spend some time on this as we close out because sure. we've talked a lot about how to argue well, how to mm. how to how to use our tactics to have fruitful conversations. And I like that you mentioned in the first episode, this isn't to teach us how to manipulate the conversation or to to be right. to do anything like that. This is actually we are trying to learn, we are trying to to gather information so that we can interact on a more meaningful level. We're we're actually trying to reach people with truth by by right. being very smart about it, about the way we go about it. That's why these tactics exist. But we need a tactic for when arguments don't seem to work. So when we're in a conversation with someone and we've reasoned it well, we've answered the question, we've used our tactics, but it just seems to be like we're hitting this brick wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your book, you mentioned three reasons that people will sort of resist a well-argued point. So let's right. let's talk a bit right. about that. And then maybe the, yeah. the action to take once we realize that's going on. Sure. Yeah. And uh, there's actually no silver bullet here, but I'll give you some insight. Um, sometimes we are tempted to think that the reason that people reject a claim is for good reasons. <laughs> That is for rational reasons. Okay. And sometimes that's the case. They don't see it. And if you can offer them rational reasons to the contrary of their view, then they're going to be more open to your view. But that 
usually takes time. So just keep that in mind. People don't change their minds quickly on important matters, okay? This is why I make a point of having as a goal, put a stone in people's shoe, you know, just do a little bit here, a little bit there. We do some gardening, okay? We don't have to harvest right away, okay? But sometimes there are other things that are going on. Sometimes, for example, um, there are emotional reasons that people have. Um, I have a distant relative in, by marriage, I guess, um, that who lost her grandfather when she was very young and she cannot believe in God because that happened to her. Now, of course, that's not a, that's not a reasonable objection because everybody dies, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. death rate is still a hundred percent, right? <laughs> so um, how could one expect that if God really existed, then Everybody else would die but somebody that they love. But you see, there's some emotional thing going on here. So sometimes the resistance is emotional and questioning can get to the issue. Or sometimes it's right out front, like in that case, I know, because this is what's been expressed. Sometimes, particularly people of certain uh, religious persuasions like Islam or, or, or Judaism, if they realize um, if they or actually any, for that matter, if they were uh, to become Christians – they are going to pay a real heavy price personally for that with personal rejection, family rejection, etc. And so they can't countenance that because it, it hurts too much to think of that possibility. Now, this isn't an issue related to the truthfulness of Christianity. This has to do with personal emotional matters with them. Some people can't consider Christianity because they would have to admit then that loved ones that have passed away without Christ are now forever separated from God, and they can't countenance that either. And so um, those are tough ones. Those are tough ones to deal with. You know, uh, I'm going to make a suggestion in a few moments, but but just keep in mind that's something that may be going on behind the scenes. There may be rational reasons or there may be emotional reasons. Sometimes there are prejudicial reasons, and prejudicial reasons are um, – it's like when people have blinders on and they have already made up their minds and they're not even going to think about it. I think a lot of Jews are like this. They say, we're not going to even think about Jesus. Why not? Because Jews don't believe in Jesus. Boom, blinders on. But what if he's the Messiah? We don't believe in Jesus kind of thing. And that's a tough one. I think a lot of atheists are like this. You know, when when um, I, I remember Dennis Prager mentioning this once, talking to atheistic groups and to religious groups. He asked religious groups, how many people think – ever doubt their convictions. And lots of people raise their hand, which is normal. I mean, doubt is, a, is normal. When he talks, talks to skeptics, groups, atheists, no one raises their hand. Wow. Really? What's going on there? Yeah. Listen, yeah. you know, this is not reasonable. This is this kind of thing that's going on. And sometimes when you listen to the way they argue, you can see that happening. Uh, the third reason is just some people are just plain old pigheaded. Mm. <laughs> okay. They just don't want God. And this is where Frank Turk's question, when he's on university campus, people press him on issues. He asked them, he said, look, if I could demonstrate, if I answer all these questions and demonstrate without a reason, with, within a reasonable um, uh, matter that Jesus actually is who he claimed to be and uh, that God exists, etc., would you turn to him and give your life to him? Good question. No. Why not? I just said if it was reasonable and blah, 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 blah. No. Well, see, now something else is going on. They're bullheaded. Okay. Yeah. So I think these are tough cases, and these are the kinds of cases where you do your best and then let God take care of the, the – the, let God work on them, pray for them. But there's one other element I can mention, and it's in the new book. It's a tactic that I call inside out. And part of the, – the point of the tactic is that God has already built certain things inside of everybody that <clears throat> even when they try to deny them come out in unguarded moments. OK, and this is why, you know, postmoderns can't stop from refuting themselves because it's obvious that we know truth in the world. Yeah. And then they talk like there is truth in the world, even when they're saying there isn't. OK, um, so that's a lot of stuff that's built inside. But part of what's built inside is a hunger and a yearning for God. It's an awareness of our own brokenness and it's a hunger for God. Augustine said it best, I think, when he said, you have made us for your, yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And so now I'm talking about an existential 
thing. That is, now I'm talking about a very subjective awareness. I'm not talking about the evidence about things out there. I'm talking about what's going on inside of us. And sometimes it's effective to speak directly to that. And for example, you might say, you know what, I, I know you got all these questions and nothing that I've said so far seems to have had any impact on you. Okay, fair enough. I just want you to know, nevertheless, there is a God. He does care. And one day you will see him and give an account for your life. And that's not going to be a pretty picture. But there is an answer. There is forgiveness for you. Now, I don't know about you. See, you just said, wow. But why? Not because I'm so clever. It's because the notion there is forgiveness for you has a power. It, it speaks powerfully to the existential need human beings have mm -hmm. and the hunger they have for acceptance and for love and ultimately for forgiveness. And so sometimes we can just kind of bypass that other and just lay that on people. Yeah. And in the oh. in the in the book tactics, the new 10th anniversary edition, I have the inside out tactic in there as a whole chapter. And I talk about Holly Ordways, uh, who I don't know if you knew, know Holly, she's a I apologist her, now. Yes, and, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and how she is an atheist and how there was an existential element that, uh, brought her to Christ. There's powerful account, uh, chronicled in, in her book, not God's type. And, uh, and I also talk about, uh, uh, um, Another a French, a Parisian atheist who became a Christian, Guillaume Bignon, yep. and he's now a wonderful. He's got a PhD in philosophy now, but his story is also similar. And I have that in there where there was an existential moment that it just he felt it. He just experienced his heart hungered for it, and this was this was this was fresh water, living water, right? Bread of life. Yeah. So you see, those are metaphors or in the in the text that speak or speak to the existential desire, hunger, and thirst. And sometimes that's going to be an effective way of reaching people when other things don't. Well, Greg, you've given us quite a bit to chew on, quite a bit to think about, quite a bit to practice as we mm. uh, as we interact with the people that God brings into our lives. Uh, I want to let the viewers know, please get the 10th anniversary edition of Tactics. It will enrich your life. I think it's one of those books every Christian needs to read. We'll link that in the podcast notes. We'll link some of the other things that we've talked about. Uh, Greg, such a joy to have you. Thank you so Thank much you. for being on my show. Well, look at I'm always at your service, Elisa. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for watching today. Don't forget to pick up Greg's book, Tactics. If you would, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and click the bell so that you get notified every time we release a new video. If you wanna learn more about how to get bonus content and early access to podcasts and blog posts, go to patreon.com slash Have a great week. Mm -hmm.